Europe had been in turmoil since the start of the French Revolutionary Wars in 1792. After five years of war, the French Republic subdued the First Coalition, an alliance of Austria, Prussia, Great Britain, Spain, and various Italian states. The Second Coalition, led by Britain, Austria, and Russia, with the support of the Ottoman Empire, Portugal, and Naples, was formed in 1798. The purpose of this alliance was to prevent the expansion of the French Republic. But by 1801, this too had been defeated, leaving Britain the only opponent of the new French consulate. In March 1802, France and Britain agreed to end hostilities under the Treaty of Amiens. But many problems persisted between the two sides, making implementation of the treaty increasingly difficult. Napoleon was angry that British troops had not evacuated the island of Malta. The tense situation only worsened when Napoleon sent an expeditionary force to crush the Haitian Revolution. In May 1803, Britain declared war on France. In December 1804, an Anglo-Swedish agreement led to the creation of the Third Coalition. British Prime Minister William Pitt spent 1804 and 1805 in a flurry of diplomatic activity geared towards forming a new coalition against France. And by April 1805, Britain and Russia had signed an alliance. Having been defeated twice in recent memory by France, and being keen on revenge, Austria joined the coalition a few months later. Before the formation of the Third Coalition, Napoleon had assembled an invasion force called the, the Army of England. He intended to use this force, amounting to 150,000 men, to strike at England, and was confident of success. These men formed the core for what Napoleon would later call La Grande Army. The army was organized into seven corps, which were large field units that contained 36 to 40 cannons each. In addition to these forces, Napoleon created a cavalry reserve of 22,000 organized into two cuirassier divisions, four mounted dragoon divisions, one division of dismounted dragoons and one of light cavalry, all supported by 24 artillery pieces. By 1805, the Grand Army had grown to a force of 350,000 men, who were well-equipped, well-trained, and led by competent officers. In August 1805, Napoleon turned his sights from the English Channel to the Rhine to deal with the new Austrian and Russian threats. On the 25th of September after a feverish march in great secrecy, 200,000 French troops began to cross the Rhine. Karl Mack who was commanding the Austrian army had gathered the greater part of the Austrian army at the fortress of Ulm. Napoleon cleverly flanked his army around the fortress which resulted in 23,000 Austrian troops surrendering. Russian delays prevented them from saving the Austrian armies. The Russians then withdrew to the northeast to await reinforcements and link up with surviving Austrian units. Tsar Alexander I appointed General Mikhail Kutuzov commander-in-chief of the combined Russo-Austrian force. On the 9th of September 1805, Kutuzov arrived at the battlefield, quickly contacting Francis I of Austria and his courtiers to discuss strategy and logistics. Kutuzov knew that Napoleon's army had to fight soon as there were many difficulties within his supply line so Kutuzov decided to retreat. Napoleon did not stay still. The French emperor decided to set a psychological trap in order to lure the Allies out, days before any fighting. Napoleon had been giving the impression that his army was weak and that he desired a negotiated peace. The plan was successful. Many of the Allied officers, including the Tsar's aides and the Austrian chief of staff France von Weir, strongly supported an immediate attack and appeared to sway Tsar Alexander. Kutuzov's plan to retreat further to the Carpathian region was rejected, and the Allied forces soon fell into Napoleon's trap. The battle began with the French army outnumbered. Napoleon had some 72,000 men and 157 guns for the impending battle, with about 7,000 troops under devout still far to the south in the direction of Vienna. The Allies had about 85,000 soldiers, 70% of them Russian, and 318 guns.
The battle began at about 8 am with the first Allied lines attacking the village of Telnitz, which was defended by the French. The French opened fire on the Allied force once they reached the village. There was ferocious fighting in the village, with the advantage shifting, continuously between each side. The Allies evicted the French from the town, forced them onto the other side of the Goldbach. The first men of Devout's corps arrived at this time and threw the Allies out of Telnitz before they too were attacked by the Allies and re-abandoned the town. Additional Allied attacks out of Telnitz were checked by French artillery. Allied columns started pouring against the French right, but not at the desired speed, so the French were mostly successful in curbing the attacks. At the time, the planners thought this slowing was disastrous, but later on it helped the Allies. Meanwhile, the leading elements of the second column were attacking the village of Sokolnitz, which was defended by the French. Initial Allied assaults proved unsuccessful and General Landrum of the Russian army ordered the bombardment of the village. This deadly barrage forced the French out. And at about the same time, the third column attacked the castle of Sokolnitz. The French, however, counterattacked and regained the village, only to be thrown out again. Sokolnitz was perhaps the most contested area in the battlefield and would change hands several times as the day progressed.
While the Allied troops attacked the French right flank, Kutuzov's 4th Corps stopped at the Pratzen Heights and stayed still. Just like Napoleon, Kutuzov realized the importance of Pratzen and decided to protect the position. But the young Tsar did not, and he moved many men away from this position. This act would be a turning point for the battle. At about 8.45 am, satisfied at the weakness in the enemy center, Napoleon asked Soult how long it would take for his men to reach the Pratzen Heights, to which the marshal replied, less than 20 minutes, sire. About 15 minutes later, Napoleon ordered the attack, adding, one sharp blow and the war is over. Russian soldiers and commanders on top of the heights were stunned to see so many French troops coming towards them. Allied commanders moved some of the delayed detachments of the 4th column into this bitter struggle. Over an hour of fighting destroyed much of this unit. The other men from the second column, mostly inexperienced Austrians, also participated in the struggle and swung the numbers against one of the best fighting forces in the French army, eventually forcing them to withdraw down the slopes. However, gripped by desperation, sent. Hilaire's men struck hard once more and bayoneted the Allies out of the heights. To the north, General Van Damme's division attacked an area called Old Vineyards, and through talented skirmishing and deadly volleys, broke several Allied battalions. The battle had firmly turned in France's favor, but it was far from over. The difficult position of the Allies was confirmed by the decision to send in the Russian Imperial Guard. Grand Duke Constantine, Tsar Alexander's brother, commanded the guard and counterattacked in Van Damme's section of the field. Sensing trouble, Napoleon ordered his own heavy guard cavalry forward. These men pulverized their Russian counterparts. But with both sides pouring in large masses of cavalry, no victory was clear. The horse artillery of the guard inflicted heavy casualties on the Russian cavalry and fusiliers. The 
The Russians broke and many died as they were pursued by the reinvigorated French cavalry for about a quarter of a month. Kiruzov was severely wounded, and his son-in-law was killed. Meanwhile, the northernmost part of the battlefield was also witnessing heavy fighting. Prince Liechtenstein's heavy cavalry assaulted Kellerman's lighter cavalry forces. The fighting initially went well for the French, but the French cavalry retreated behind the infantry divisions once it became clear Russian numbers were too great. The infantry halted the Russian assaults and permitted Murat to send two cuirassier divisions the fray to finish off the Russian cavalry for good. The ensuing melee was better than mine, but the French ultimately prevailed. Lands then led his 5th Corps against Bagration's men and after hard fighting managed to drive the skilled Russian commander off the field. He wanted to pursue, but Murat, who was in control of this sector in the battlefield, was against the idea. Napoleon's focus now shifted towards the southern end of the battlefield where the French and the Allies were still fighting over Sokolnitz and Telnitz in an effective double-pronged assault. So, Hilaire's division and part of Devout's Third Corps smashed through the enemy at Sokolnitz. General Kimer covered the Allied withdrawal with the O'Reilly Light Cavalry. They managed to defeat five of six French cavalry regiments before they too had to retreat. General Panic now seized the Allied army and it abandoned the field in all possible directions. French artillery pounded towards the men, 